I want to welcome you to our book symposium. This is a book symposium on the ghetto in global history, edited by my colleagues Wendy Goldman and Joe Trotter. So the history department at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, has a book symposium when colleagues come out with a new book. And we see this as a contribution to both intellectual exchange in the department and between members of the department um, and other people on campus, other campuses, other universities, and the general community. So thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to briefly introduce the introducer of the panel, it's kind of, you know, multiple introductions. Uh, someone should have introduced me, and, you know, we could go way back. Um, and that is uh, Davarian Baldwin. Davarian Baldwin is the doctor, um, Dr. Baldwin is the Paul E. Rather Distinguished Professor of American Studies at Trinity College. He is a historian of, and cultural critic and social theorist of urban America. He's the author of Chicago's New Negroes, Modernity, The Great Migration, and Black Urban Life, and co-editor of the essay collection, Escape from New York, one of my favorite movies, uh, The New Negro Renaissance Beyond Harlem. Thank you. Good afternoon. All right, that's great. Good to hear, good to hear you all here. So um, it is really uh, my pleasure to be here this afternoon to have this discussion with you all, um, with my esteemed colleagues that are here. And um, I just want to offer a couple of framing comments to kind of think about how, um, what reading this collection made me think about and how I um, could enter the conversation and what I consider to be the usefulness and the timeliness of this wonderful collection by Professors Trotter and Goodman. So, you know, f right now, from whether it's the, the former Soviet states, Western Europe, or, or even in the United States, pundits and everyday citizens are decrying the rise of what has been called authoritarian nationalism across the globe. And from this concern, a, a question or a set of questions have arisen around what is being shorthanded as democracy in crisis in the face of what's being called an erupting fascism. Not surprisingly, in the face of this democratic crisis, thoughtful individuals are turning to the past, hence why we're here, mining the archive of our shared experiences to help make sense of the present. Of course, this slice of history that continually gets discussed is the mid 20th century age of fascism and its physical manifestation in the form of the ghetto. But herein also lies the problem. In response to appeals to power based on land, racial, or frozen cultural and historical populisms so central to fascist state formation, we have seen an equally insular, provincial, and inward-looking outlook. Whether the call is for Brexit, uh, asking questions about the Frenchness of the World Cup winning and multiracial national football team, or the wall building initiatives in our own backyard, there's never been a better time to recover a global history of the ghetto and its various machinations. For me, this concern with the ghetto has become especially vital because even in the most progressive of circles in the US, the response to the democratic crisis and the resurgence of fascism has continually circled back to the New Deal. But with a dangerous tone of American exceptionalism shot all the way through the discussion. The argument here is that the New Deal archive presents us with an especially American anecdote with its triumphant strong state of social programs and civic spirit that produced the greatest generation who in wartime made the world safe for democracy. In the face of these grand celebrations of a homegrown historical anecdote to fascism, I want to turn your attention to the darkened corner 
of the archive of this greatest generation. In a 1937 editorial in the Chicago Defender, long before the US had turned its attention to Germany, the writer of this editorial signaled how irony had reached its full apex when the Jewish American judge, Michael Feinberg, had upheld a racially restrictive covenant in a significantly Jewish neighborhood of Hyde Park and home of the liberal University of Chicago. The editorial swiftly reminded Judge Feinberg that, quote, he is perhaps only a generation away from a Russian or Polish ghetto. But one may ask why. Why did these African Americans, these activists and writers, deploy at the time a distinctly Jewish term, ghetto, to make sense of racial segregation? The title of the editorial was called Building Ghettos. Well, the claims of an exceptionally American brand of democratic promise as the world's savior in the face of a worldwide fascism was so strong that black fights against state-sanctioned distributions of political power and resources along racial lines was deemed illegible. How could there be ghettos in the home of democracy, the country that's going to save us? from fascism. Well, in the face of this, the only way that African Americans felt they could turn to make visible their story was abroad. They had to go global. They had to be transnational. They had to be comparative in their analysis in the very same way that the authors are in this wonderful collection today. They understood that if an internal critique of inequality was difficult in the face of American exceptionalism, that we are the solution, and heaven forbid, not the problem, then they had to deploy a comparative and transnational approach. This vision became even broader as a part of a national campaign called American Ghetto's American Style, where black activists all over the country began to fight against the powerful providence of the federal housing authority sponsoring racial segregation. So what's the point here? The point here is that no longer can we say that one group owns this history of the ghetto. And I thank the authors for opening up the archive that was always far broader than we've been allowed to imagine. But moreover, the point here is that Goldman and Trotter's approach to the ghetto has a history. That in that very same archive of the ghetto, we can see the already existing strategic intellectual and moral advance of a comparative and transnational examination of the ghetto as a powerful weapon to demonstrate collective pain and struggles against that pain, to provincialize national narratives of democratic ascendance that are being applied whole cloth to the globe, to fight against insular, national, or even nationalist solutions to problems that touch even the most democratic parts of the globe. The history of the ghetto is here and it's now. To the young people, to young people in the audience, what does it mean to recover the meaning of the ghetto from Europe, the US, South Africa, as a noun when it's so perversely become an adjective, i.e. that's so ghetto? What does it mean to understand that original usage of the ghetto served as a political critique of structural and state-sanctioned inequality in a time like now. Hence, the archive, the history of the ghetto is a living, breathing reality, a living, breathing phenomena that Goldman and Trotter have brought to us. To be sure, we don't want to overwhelm the integrity of the past with our present day concerns. But at the same time, history is and is being used as a weapon. These archives are sites of struggle. And I thank the authors for making the history of the ghetto as broad, deep, and robust as possible so that we can no longer deploy selective aspects of this past that benefit some but damage us all. So thank you so much. And now to pay further tribute to the spirit of the work that we've witnessed here. We have two distinguished scholars, public intellectuals, 
thinkers and citizens of the world to come before us to offer their remarks on whatever intersection of the ghetto they choose to discuss. So we have of two individuals. We have Daniel Meekman, who is currently head of Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum and Center of Israel. Also, Mr. Meekman has held many professorships in a number of university settings. As an author, he is most famously known for his wonderful book, The Emergence of Nazi Ghettos During the Holocaust. He will be followed by Mitchell Dunier, who is an American sociologist. He is currently the Maurice P. Durring Professor and Department Chair of Sociology at Princeton University. And amongst his many publications, he is most recently the author of Ghetto, The Invention of a Place, The Invention of Place, The History of an Idea. So let's first welcome Mr. Mick. Thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon uh, <coughs> to all of you, especially to Professors uh, Goldman, Trotter, and Harsh, and the colleagues on the panel. <laughs> I would like to tell you about two surprises that I experienced regarding the symposium of today. The first one is the very fact that I was invited to be here, <coughs> coming from afar, a flight of 22 hours, right? So, <laughs> which is also very costly, and without having early academic or other contact with the organizers, only on the basis of my study on the Jewish ghettos of the Nazi era. This meant a lot to me because it proved that my study has had an impact in a broader circle than just a limited group of scholars who deal with Nazi ghettos in the Nazi era, <laughs> which are, are my usual circle. Uh, Around. The second surprise was the fact that uh, Professor Strutter, Goldman, and Haas sent the invitation letter on July 24, 2017, almost 15 months ago. They proposed three possible dates for the symposium, and I first thought that it was set in October 2017, <clears throat> and I checked my availability, availability at these days. It seemed as if I couldn't make it, and it was about to decline, but then I reread the invitation and saw that the date was 2018. <laughs> so I really, I readily accepted it, and as you can see, I'm here. And glad to participate in a discussion in, discussion in the wake of the publication of indeed this <clears throat> most interesting book, The Ghetto in Global History, 1500 to the Present, which is the outcome of a project which took several years and the, uh, the course was there on the table, right? <clears throat> if you had the opportunity to eat that uh, program of four years ago. So for both surprises, I want to thank the organizers from the depth of our heart, and now to the issue itself. <clears throat> ghettos are not an ignored topic in scholarly research. Early modern ghettos in Italy, and especially in Venice and Rome, have drawn the attention of historians of Jewish history since the emergence of modern Jewish historiography in the 19th century. In the present volume, Benjamin Ravid and Kenneth Stau, two of the leading scholars on these ghettos, present insightful characteristics resulting from their lifelong studies on especially these two ghettos. Bernard of Cooperman and Samuel Gruber add new views emanating from newer methodologies, especially urban studies. Yet these studies, as is actually the case with research on the early modern ghettos in general, focus essentially on Italian and Italian Jewish history. By the way, by doing so, this Italy-centered historiography did not pay attention to the fact that actually the second ghetto after Venice was, was established not in Rome, but in Ragusa or Dubrovnik, <clears throat> which is outside Italy, but had a context with Venice. So they stop at the borders of Italy. In some cases, the Italian ghettos have been compared to other Jewish quarters, mainly the one in Frankfurt. But no real historical link have been suggested between these different settings. Nazi ghettos have been at the center of Jewish Holocaust research from the very beginnings of its emergence of this 
historiography in the immediate post-1945 years after the end of World War II. <coughs> Philip Friedman and Mark Dworzecki in their outlines for the needed research on the Holocaust, which were conceived in the beginning of the 1950s, defined the ghetto as an important chapter. In 1950, Jewish sociologist and survivor Samuel Greengrouse published a seminal study with the title, Some Methodologi Methodologi Methodological Problems in the Study of the Ghetto. Um, but this study was, was published when uh, actually real research on ghettos was not yet available at the time. And therefore, he drew more on his personal experience uh, of, uh, from the time of the ghetto in Poland. Since then, detailed studies on many ghettos have been written, especially by Israeli historians, following the example of Israel Gutmann's study of the Warsaw Ghetto. They all put an emphasis on Jewish life in the ghettos. From the perpetrator perspective, ghettos have also been a major component of the attempt of historians, such as Raoul Hilberg, Saul Friedlander, Christopher Browning, Peter Longerich, and many more, to understand the escalation of Nazi anti-Jewish policies from their initial stage up to the final solution. However, from both the perpetrator and the Jewish perspective, these ghettos were studied as a chapter within Holocaust history with no earlier context. And even within the context of the Holocaust, many statements regarding the ghetto phenomenon were in fact assumptions, which, were <coughs> gradually, uh, which then gradually entrenched in scholarship, but they were not based on real research in-depth research in the, uh, the different, different cases. Regarding the use of the ghetto concept in America, the situation is, of course, slightly different. Both in literature and scholarship, to which Jewish immigrants from Europe at the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 20th century contributed considerably, the term ghetto and its connotations were indeed linked to the earlier European Jewish experience, and you mentioned this also. This is extremely well depicted in my eyes in the chapters written by Tobias Brinkman and Avigail Oren in the current volume, chapters that were, for me, eye-openers. Nevertheless, due to, so, due to the so different theater of American society, as well as the fact that the word ghetto was turned by Wirth in 1928 into a sociological concept, the origins of the phenomenon fell into oblivion. I will create, uh, quote Mitch Dunier's observation in the introduction to his book, Ghetto, the Invention of, place, of a Place, the History of an Idea. For many of the undergraduate students who take my seminar on the idea of the ghetto, it comes as news that Jews were not blacks, were the original ghettoized people. And a colleague of mine at my university who is of American origin and had the same experience in his lectures here <coughs> in America. North American scholars who have dealt with black and Hispanic densely populated poor neighborhoods in major cities essentially related to it as a clear American phenomenon resulting from American race relations and urban development. That is, the American ghetto was treated again as a separate phenomenon. I think that one can characterize the chapters of Stephen Robertson, Jeffrey Gonda, and Brian Purnell in this book as falling into that pattern. About the South African scene, I did not know much before reading this book. However, from the most enlightening chapters by Don Curry, Alex Lichtenstein, and Gavin Steingo, I can <coughs> learn that the term is essentially used by scholars, hardly in popular discourse. Scholars followed American concepts, using them as tools to analyze the local situa situation of segregated urban localities. Therefore, the usage here has lost its original connotations, and when associations are made, they are made with America. It would be interesting to explore, in my eyes, the discourse in the Jewish community in South Africa. How did they use the term, if they did it at all, <clears throat> or avoided it and what connections they made. So there is still something to be done there. Summing up, in spite of the fact that the same term has been used, and while knowing vaguely that it originated in late medieval Venice, the phenomena in the different locations were and are usually studied separately, but the term is used. Recent interest in the topic has changed this situation. 
the volume published here by you, and therefore I think it's so important, and Mitch <coughs> Dunier's book, and I think my own study, though approaching the topic from very different angles, all have in common that they look for connections and influences that go beyond the strictly local situations and the period <coughs> as such. At this point, I would like to explain how I was driven to my own study, a study that I had never thought before of doing. Almost 16 years ago, we decided at Yad Vashem, the Holocaust <coughs> Memorial Institution in Israel, um, to compose an encyclopedia of ghettos of the Nazi era. In my position at Yad Vashem, it was my task to write an introduction, which I thought I could do in a short time. Writing 10 pages, 12 pages, for us, that is a regular <coughs> uh, business, right? Uh, we sat down to plan the project, asking ourselves how many people should work on the project. How much time would it take to finish the project? What would the appropriate budget be? or should be, in order to plan that well, we started to ask ourselves the following questions, and I'll mention them. How many ghettos existed during the Holocaust? Here came the first surprise. Nobody knew the number, even not approximately. So <coughs> at the uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum website, they wrote 700. In another book, which was published, there several thousands. And we, had, we didn't have our own numbers. One could find... <coughs> these and various other numbers in the existing literature. But it were all guesses. Second question was, what exactly was the Nazi definition or concept of the ghetto? And conse consequently, its purpose? It turned out that there was no clear one. This was emphasized by the fact that Germans, Jews, and scholars not always used the term in the same way. In quite a number of cases during the final solution, the Germans emptied the ghetto from its Jewish inhabitants and deported them to death camp or killing sites, leaving on the spot only a little cohort of Jewish forced laborers. The Germans, from that moment on, called the place a Zwangsarbeitslager, a forced laborers camp. But the Jews called it the little ghetto because they were still the same spot. Additionally, in the scholarly literature, literature, one will find the term ghetto being used for concentrations of Jews when neither local German authorities nor the local Jews use the term in real time. That is, the scholars impose their understanding of the term on a situation which was not called in real time by any of the actors in this way. The third question, when exactly did the idea of establishing ghettos for Jews take shape? No real answer could be found in the literature, only that from a certain moment, uh, ghettos emerged. Moreover, scholars agree that the first ghetto in Poland was established in Piotrkov Trybunalski. However, there was no study of that ghetto, but because there's not enough documentation. So you go to the place where there is documentation, uh, under the lantern, where, where there's light, you, you start to study, not where it begins. A fourth question was, what was the foundational order for the establishment of ghettos? Was there one at all? And several scholars have suggested a certain document, which is a very important document from September 19, 21st, 1939. But if you read the document very well, you see there is no order. It's just mentioning that there are ghettos. So who in the Nazi bureaucracy supported the idea or who opposed it? The literature always uses the very general expression, the Germans. But there were some 80 million Germans and Austrians and Volksdeutsche at the time. So who exactly among them had this <coughs> idea? Therefore, the people and the motivation behind the idea remained mysterious. It was accepted that the Germans wanted it. Was the ghetto phenomenon inherently linked to the development of the idea of the final solution? Many scholars assumed so. But if so, what about the implementation of the final solution in places where there was no ghetto? Was the ghetto phenomenon intrinsically linked to the Jewish council phenomenon, the Judenrat? Raoul Hilberg, in his 1961 important study, The Destruction of the European Jews, and Isaiah Trunk, in his 1972 study, Judenrat, Definitely thought so. Hilberg's review, for instance, of Trunk's book on the Judenrat was titled The Ghetto as a Form of Government. So they are both linked. 
not to use the Rat as a form of government. But what if there were many Jewish councils without ghettos and some ghettos without Jewish councils? No answer. Summarizing what happened is that all our ideas about Nazi ghettos, which were based on decades of Holocaust research, actually decomposited, fell apart. Therefore, a reconceptualization of the phenomenon, its emergence and functioning was needed. So when I then started to analyze the situation, it became clear to me that the existing perpetrator historiography of the Holocaust had a bug. And the bug was the emphasis on political and organizational history and the history of ideas, but not on cultural history, and even less so on the history of concepts. Generalizing, I would say that linguistic sensitivity is almost entirely missing in the bulk of Holocaust historiography. Much of the perp of perpetrator Holocaust historiography also internalized Raoul Hilberg's conceptual model of the Holocaust, which identified ghettoization uh, with concentration and perceived ghettoization as a logic step in the escalation process towards the final solution. On the other hand, historiography of Jewish life during the Holocaust, the historiographies who first historian were predominantly survivors from Poland took the term as granted too because they were not much interested in the origins of the phenomenon but in the ways in which Jews tried to persevere in ghetto conditions of that era. So we became aware of the fact that not even one scholar asked the question why did the Germans use the term ghetto at all? In many encyclopedia entries on ghettos, also one by Benjamin Ravid, <clears throat> or in histories of the early modern era on the, uh, on the one hand and of Nazi Germany on the other, one will find a description of the ghetto in the relevant period with the addition that the term origines, originates in Venice in the early 16th century and that the Nazis also used them, that term, but that the Nazi ghetto was entirely different from the early modern one. But if indeed these phenomena were so different from each other, why was the same term used? Why didn't the Nazis use some other term, X, Y, Z, or Abracadabra, or whatever, <laughs> right? So the answer to this question <coughs> could be found only through the linguistic track. Tracing the twisted path of how the term was used and how its semantics slowly developed from 16th century Venice to Poland of the end of the 1930s, before and after the German occupation, and then spread to other localities in Eastern Europe. A long durée path of more than four centuries and of various locations. For me, within the context of Holocaust research, this meant connecting this event in a much more sophisticated way to the broader context and developments of European history. Unfortunately, and here I have a discussion with something in the book, with Tim Cole, a scholar who made a very important contribution to urban history and the history of Hungarian anti-Semitism in his book about the Budapest ghetto, missed this point in his reading of the Yad Vashem Encyclopedia of the Ghettos during the Holocaust and of the consequent expanded version of my introduction to the encyclopedia, which I published in the book that was <coughs> mentioned. Uh, both in his chapter in the current volume and in an earlier review of my book, he juxtaposed the definition adopted by Yad Vashem, which resulted from <laughs> this inquiry with the one applied by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in the volume on ghettos in its Encyclopedia of Camps and Ghettos, which stuck to the Hilbergian understanding. He calls the Yad Vashem def definition excluding and the USHMN one including, also saying that the USHMN one paid, and I quote, particular attention to how this place was referred to by contemporaries, whether that was the German authorities or the Jewish victims. However, I think the opposite is in fact the case when you check the USHMN encyclopedia, <coughs> Uh, they followed, as said Raoul Hilberg's understanding, that any concentration is identical with ghettoization, and that ghettoization was an intentional planned measure of the Nazi bureaucracy, an understanding that had been taken over by lots of scholars who call places ghettos even when neither the Germans nor the Jews used the term, as I said before. Consequently, <coughs> the USHMM encyclopedia includes places that are called only by scholars uh, 
as ghettos, or if a survivor 60 years later testified that we lived in ghetto conditions, right? Not saying that it was really a ghetto. So one of my claims was and is, and that approach was followed by the Yad Vashem team, that ghettoization was not identical with concentration. The ghetto under the Nazis was first in the early years of their rule in the 1930s, a metaphor for social exclusion of the Jews. With the occupation of Poland, the German troops and authorities encountered densely populated downridden neighborhoods where poor Jews lived, <coughs> which were called ghettos by the Jews and their neighbors, and they encountered them as effect on the ground. Then, gradually and not systematically, a policy evolved of restricting Jews in many, but not all places, to these neighborhoods that existed already. The phenomenon then spread to other occupied territories in Eastern and Central and East Central Europe. And only there, except for Theresienstadt in um, what is now the Czech Republic, was at the time the protectorate Bohemia Moravia, and Salonika in Greece. <coughs> and they became the ghettos then became one of the tools of persecution. Then the term was also copied by the Romanian authorities and used for places in Transnistria where Jews were deported to, places that sometimes were also called camps. So it is not very clear. Sometimes the same place is called a ghetto or a camp. Galimir Tibon's article in this volume relates to the situation. Finally, the term was used for concentrations of Jews which was set up intentionally as part of the implementation of the final solution through deportation in Salonika and Hungary. The Holocaust scene thus presents a complicated and constantly changing picture in which the pl places that are called ghettos are very different from each other in setting and purpose and in the different times, although it's a very short time. The ghettos of Piotrkow, Tribunalski and Warsaw in Poland in the early period of the occupation Baranovich and Pinsk in the so in occupied Soviet Union, about which Tzvi Gitterman and Lenore Weizmann write in their article in this volume. Thank you. Theresienstadt in the Protectorate, Bohemia Moravia, 1941. Salonika in German occupied Greece in 1943. And Budapest in German controlled Hungary in 1944 can hardly be put into one basket regarding the function in the Nazi persecution campaign. Therefore, a rigid use of the term by scholars, even when real-term usage by Germans, Romanians, Hungarians, and Jews was different, is in my eyes misleading. Cole makes a generalizing statement from the lens of Budapest and Hungary, which is the latest and very different phase of the Nazi era ghetto phenomenon. Moreover, he could not sever himself from the Hilberian concept, which identifies ghettoization with concentration, as said, and views the ghetto as a major cog in the Nazi persecution model. <clears throat> Helen Zinreich, on the other hand, in her article in this volume, entirely agrees with the understanding that I <clears throat> think is the right one. Annika Valka, who deals with the territory of the Soviet Union, lips, limits herself, in fact, to the functioning of ghettos there during the final solution period, when there's hardly a discrepancy between ghettoization and concentration. But in the project, project run <coughs> by Ann Knowles and Valke, they mention the existence of 1,400 ghettos, which clearly indicates that they also embrace the concentration is ghettoization concept. <clears throat> so to my regret, we can observe two trends in historical research on the Holocaust era um, regarding uh, the, uh, the usage of the, of the term ghetto, and I think more clarity, uh, there is on the one hand more clarity, and on the other hand more confusion. So no doubt that the history of the ghettos of the Nazi period is exceptional, which is emphasized even more by the fact that Germany enacted in 2002 a law to compensate Jewish forced laborers in ghettos, the ghetto Rentengesetz, something that we don't find in any other ghetto situation. But it is nevertheless part of a much larger phenomenon in development in urban history and sociology. 
It relates to densely populated and poor neighborhoods within cities. Whatever the reason for that situation is not necessarily imposed, and here again we can argue, the question is with uh, Benjamin Ravid's uh, uh, definition, um, and I think Mitch will deal with that too. In the volume that we celebrate today, and in Mitch's book, the dynamic approach to ghetto history and sociology is extended even further beyond the contours of Jewish history. The links between different chapters of this history are explored further, and the common thread is the importance of the spatial dimension in human life combined with the linguistic border crossings. What you see through this lens is a term that travels through cultures and times, a word that first accidentally stuck to a local Jewish situation in Venice, was then copied to other cities inside and outside Italy, then generalized also for places in Europe where there were Jewish neighborhoods but with different names, then turned from indicating a physical urban Jewish situation into a metaphor on the one hand and into a sociological term in America on the other, a term that is applied by scholars and used in daily discourse for other social groups, both in America, South Africa, and other locations. That is, the term evokes a certain association, which we may call the core meaning, but functions and is interpreted differently in different locations and situations. <clears throat> I think that the fluidity of the term, which that, does not allow uh, for one definition, and sc scholars should be aware of that. <clears throat> All right. um, and that is one of the important lessons to be learned from this, this volume. More research on similar situations and their integration into this grand picture of the traveling concept along the lines pointed out in the conclusions of this book, <clears throat> by Wendy Goldman and Joe Trotter, such as the interwar Jewish ghettos in, Pol uh, in Poland or the Jewish Mlachs in North Africa, uh, are also uh, places and locations that I think are worth uh, to be uh, explored. Um, anyhow, uh, ending my thoughts about this in the wake of this book is that <clears throat> it is a very important book contributing to and thought-provoking uh, about the whole issue of the ghetto uh, and that we have to be very careful uh, when we use the term and think not only about the similarities but very much about the differences in the different locations. So thank you and my blessings for the Thank you so much to Professors Meekman and Dunier. Um, I'm gonna take a little bit of executive license right now uh, because it's important that when you are in certain places that you give respect and honor to those who, who um, you feel deserve it. And so whenever I get the opportunity to, to, to talk uh, before Professors Goldman and try to talk, I wanna embarrass Professor Trotter a little bit uh, because um, he's the reason why I became a professor. Um, I don't think he even remembers this story, uh, even though I, I tell it every time I see him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, was, it was over 25 years ago when I was a sophomore in, uh, at Marquette University in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And he, uh, I, I was thinking, I didn't know, I was in a crisis about what I wanted to do with my life, lawyer. I, I, I started out wanting to do communications and public relations, and it was so boring. I thought, what am I going to do now? And, and uh, I was involved in this Ronald E. McNair program, encouraging faculty, you know, I wasn't involved yet, I was considering it, encouraging students of color to go into academia, but coming from a, a a home of factory workers and domestics. I didn't know what that actually meant. Um, even though I was dealing with professors on a daily basis, it still didn't mean anything to me. And uh, one day, the organization had a, a lecture by the author of Black Milwaukee uh, come to us. And, and that was great, the lecture was great, but, but after the lecture, we all went to, out to dinner, which is something that's also great for you know, uh, working class students to be able to have the access to a professor in a direct way. And to be able to, I sat next to him, and, and I'm sure I bugged the hell out of him. I, I grilled him questions about, what, what is this? What do y'all do? And, and what's the point of it? And how do y'all do it? And, and you know, he's, the way he always is, very generous and calm. And I'm sure I was aggressive and unruly, but he, he took it all in stride. And, and, and he explained to me the, the process and the, and, the, and the joy and the benefits and the struggles. And, and by the end of that dinner, I knew that that's, that's what I wanted to do with my life. And, 
and 25 years later, here we are. And so I just want to thank you for that. You know. So having said that, um, to bring it back to the conversation, um, we will have remarks by the esteemed co-editors of this wonderful collection. Um, and followed by, following that, um, we will have questions and answers if we have, I hope we have time. So um, please welcome the two co-editors in the, in the order of Goldman and Trotter. Thank you. So for me, uh, this book has been a journey through half a millennium and around the world. Uh, we've talked today about the four different case studies, the early modern Jewish ghetto, Nazi ghettos, African American ghettos, and South African townships. And when we first began the Sawyer Seminar, I thought that one of the most interesting things that was going to come out of it was going to be a comparison between four separate cases. And actually, that was part of the interest. So one of the things that we discovered was that these four separate fields had very developed scholarships within them, but the scholars did not cross those lines, either temporarily in time or in terms of national boundaries. In other words, there was very little discussion between a scholar like Dan Michman and Devarian Baldwin. Um, those kinds of syntheses or even discussions were not occurring. And then it turned out that within these four separate studies, four separate historiographies, there were some quite amazing parallels between the debates within each of those four studies. That was very, very interesting. So for example, um, in three of the cases, and I'm going to exclude Nazi ghettos here because they are uh, something that was quite different uh, in terms of annihilation and murder, but in three of the cases, there were very robust debates over whether or not ghettos were able to create vibrant cultures that offered some protection from the external racism or anti-Semitism of the outside world. Early modern Jewish ghettos, African American ghettos, and South African townships were all places of vibrant and self-contained cultures. And even in Nazi ghettos, where the inhabitants were actually slaughtered within periods of about a month to up to three years, you also found music, scholarship, religious observance, politics, and education that went on despite Nazi prohibition. And yet, within each of these cases, the historians were actually quarreling among themselves. What were ghettos? Were they places that deformed and limited their inhabitants? Or were they places where creativity and cultures of resistance were able to flourish? A second debate among historians in all four cases was, why were ghettos created? What was the primary motivation of those in power? And here too, very interesting similarities. Were ghettos created primarily for economic reasons? Or were they motivated by racial and religious hatred? In other words, was there a primacy of ideology or was there a primacy of material factors? Finally, in terms of parallel that emerged, we began with a basic definition. Compulsory, segregated, and enclosed. Those three aspects. And yet, Within all of the case studies, 
there were debates over the question of permeability. Or in other words, how enclosed were ghettos? How much back and forth was going on over the walls, under the walls, through the walls, in all kinds of ways? Walls that were legal, actual, metaphorical. What was going on? So two of our contributors were GIS mappers. In other words, they were able to completely map two ghettos. One was Harlem in the 1920s, and the other was a Nazi ghetto in Budapest uh, during the Nazi era. Stephen Robertson, for example, argued that after mapping Harlem, and he mapped everything, he was able to figure out employment, where people worked, where they lived, where they recreated, where they went in the summer. After mapping all of this stuff, he came to the conclusion Harlem was not a ghetto. And that, in fact, so many black people left Harlem during the day for work or recreation. So many white people entered Harlem for entertainment or for other reasons that you had so much back and forth, you couldn't call Harlem a ghetto. You had to call it, in his words, a racially variegated area. Now, that was his argument, OK? It's not necessarily the argument of the volume. I myself don't know, is he right or is he wrong? But that was his argument. Similarly, we had Tim Cole looked at the Nazi ghetto in Budapest. There it turned out there was no particular area in which the Jews were concentrated and then walled in. Rather, what happened was various apartment buildings were designated as Jewish. In other words, the residents were under certain restrictions. They couldn't leave or walk the sidewalks at certain times of the day which or night, which actually made it impossible for them to go to the market to buy food. So you had starvation occurring as a result of this confinement, but do we call this a ghetto? What is this? So here, too, was an example of a very different um, sort of approach, and I think an example of the variation, in fact, that Mitchell Dunier has talked about. However, in addition to these striking parallels within these separate fields of walled-off study, the most unexpected thing that soon began to emerge for me as the Sawyer Seminar unfolded, and which then became the basis of the introduction that Joe and I wrote, was another issue entirely. And that was the trajectory of the practice of ghettoization as it traversed the world. And it was a trajectory that began with the word. This word turned out to have a fascinating etymology and evolution. A power and an adaptability to last 500 years and counting. It traversed the globe and it was used both to create and to resist the practice. So as many of you know, and has been referred to now today, the very first ghetto was created in 1516 in Venice. It was created on the site of an old copper foundry. And in Italian, foundry is ghetto, G E T. T -O. That's the origin of the word. This was a, where the practice first got its name. In 1555 then, so a number of years later, Pope Paul IV then decreed that ghetto, this place where Jews in Venice were enclosed, 
was then to be established for the Jewish population in Rome, which had been living freely throughout the city. The practice then spread through the northern papal states and through Italy. Jews were confined to small, increasingly overcrowded and filthy areas, and they were unable to live outside these walls. The French Revolution and revolutionary movements of the 19th century then helped to destroy these ghettos. But the gates to the Roman ghetto did not fall until 1870. That's relatively late, 1870. Yet even after the fall of these gates, the last gates to the ghetto, neither the word nor the practice died. In fact, both word and practice then moved in two separate directions. First, it moved west to America, carried by German Jews who used ghetto as a pejorative in a similar way to the way it's used here in the United States. Only they were not referring to African Americans. They were referring to their fellow Jews from Eastern Europe who they considered to be less educated, less wealthy, and less assimilated than themselves. They became ghetto Jews. These less assimilated Jews who spoke Yiddish and came from small villages, settled in neighborhoods like the East End of London and the Lower East Side, from where I'm from, in neighborhoods that were poor, overcrowded, noisy, and culturally apart from white American culture. Then, following this massive wave of Jewish migration to the United States, we have a second massive great migration that occurs, African Americans moving from south to north. They, too, were crowded into poor housing, segregated, compulsory, and I think you could make the argument enclosed in the sense that if you can't live anywhere else, you are enclosed. And in many cases, they actually began replacing the Jewish population. We have an example of that actually right here in Pittsburgh and in other places as well. And as Abigail Oren found, and she's been mentioned now a number of times in her corpus linguistic study of the African American press, she computerized the African American press and looked for the word ghetto. When does it first appear in the African American press? It had been thought it was post-war. That's not true. What Abigail found, actually, was that we begin to see the word as early as the 1920s. And it was being used both by African American journalists and by Jewish Yiddish journalists to describe a practice of compulsory segregation and poverty that both were opposed to. And it's showing up actually in both places. So very interesting, an early example of collaboration. What? Oh, Abigail, take a stand up and give us a little bow. <laughs> We also have Waverly in the back. Uh, Come on, Waverly. <laughs> OK. Meanwhile, I had said the ghetto moved west. The ghetto moves east. European colonial authorities resurrected practices of segregation to confine native people in Africa to certain areas and to maintain African cities as all white. With Hitler's rise to power in the early 1930s, 
Nazi dreams now of a great German colony in Poland and the Soviet Union. The Slavs were to become slaves to work for Germany. This dream of this great colony drew now on colonial practices that were used in Africa. So, as well as church practices that had been used against the Jewish population in the early modern period. So we have two streams that are informing now Nazi ideology and practice. And we now have concentrations of Jews from all over Europe, people torn from their homes and shoved into already existing Jewish neighborhoods in cities in Warsaw, in Łódź, Vilna, Bialystok, and other places. And these places become preludes then to the Holocaust. After the war, African-American and Jewish civil rights activists begin fighting hard against racial segregation and ghettoization in the United States. And having just fought World War II, and many of those concentration camps were liberated by African-American soldiers, so they understood something about what all of this meant, civil rights activists now begin consciously using this word, ghetto, to name the segregation in urban places in the United States. And why do they use this word? Because there's a general, a general horror and revulsion about Nazi practices in Europe. So to call something ghetto now has a power behind it. So we can see the word, the practice, and resistance to the practice traversing the globe. We've got 500 years of history here, folks from Venice to Rome, to Eastern Europe, to America, to colonized Africa, and then resurrected again by the Nazis as part of their dream of a colony in the East, back to America, then to be used by civil rights activists, white and black, against discrimination and enclosure of black Americans. So finally, let me just make one last comment here with all of this. The word ghetto contains within it both a practice of oppression, but also a means to call attention to that oppression. And it shows us that in every practice, no matter how oppressive no matter how humiliating, that practice contains within it the seeds of its own resistance. And I think in these days, that is no small measure of hope. Wow. <laughs> First of all, I want to say thank you for coming. And I especially want to thank our symposium chair, Davarian Baldwin, and for those kind comments that you made. <laughs> and I want to thank our commentators, Dan Meekman and Mitchell Donier, and thank you for all the nice commentary that you made on our book and for being here. Um, your thoughtful comments are greatly appreciated. When Wendy Goldman asked me to collaborate on this project, I was not sure that I could. I've been, I, I had spent most of my life trying to get away from the ghetto. <laughs> no, trying to really punch holes in the ghetto, so to speak. But on a serious note, Nearly 30 years ago, 
my generation of young historians believed that the ghetto had lost its vitality and utility as a way for understanding the black urban experience. In our view, the ghetto obscured much more than it illuminated. It emphasized the primacy of white racism over class, labor, and economic developments. It also gave insufficient attention to the role of blacks themselves, particularly poor and working class blacks, in their own place-making history. Ghetto scholars documented what we might call an unending cycle of poor housing, health, and social conditions. These conditions they believe, like European Jewish ghettos, were practically total, involuntary, and perpetual. And so for my generation, the ghetto had taken on this ahistorical kind of orientation. By the turn of the new millennium, however, an expanding body of scholarship on black workers, women, and community development had placed the ghetto, as we critiqued it, as a conceptual framework, had placed it on the defensive. Following the modern black freedom movement, rising numbers of young historians vowed to break out of the intellectual iron cage of the ghetto. Scholars of class formation got there first, followed by increasing studies of the intersections of gender, class, sexuality, and race. These were the keys for unlocking, for sort of unlocking, and creating a broader and more complete understanding of the racially fragmented landscape. And so it keys for unlocking the ghetto. As the 21st century got underway, few urban historians use the term ghetto anymore to describe and analyze the black experience. But the ghetto did not vanish from intellectual discourse. In 1996, and by the way, I want to say this. Um, in a way, I think that generation of historians in some ways undercut this earlier way of thinking about the ghetto, and scholars, the young scholars started to pull back from employing the ghetto as a framework or a term. But the ghetto by no means vanished, as this book suggests. Here we are, and here I am, you know, talking about the ghetto. <laughs> but strategically, and, and sort of at the moment, it was in 1996 when Princeton University Press published Thomas Segrew's book, The Origins of the Urban Crisis, Race and Inequality in Postwar Detroit, it was at that moment that the ghetto received new life. Segrew's book opened a new era in the study of racially divided urban communities. It breathed new life into the ghetto as a tool for understanding crucial dimensions of black urban life, especially residential segregation and its impact on e economic inequality. Whereas the first wave of black ghettoization studies focused on the late 19th and early 20th century, Segrew's book explored the second half of the 20th century. It built explicitly upon the conceptual framework of Anna Hirsch's groundbreaking book entitled Making the Second Ghetto, Race and Housing in Chicago, 1940 to 1960, published by the University of Chicago Press in 1983. 
But it also built quite explicitly upon sociologist Douglas Massey and Nancy Denton's book called American Apartheid, Segregation, and the Making of the Underclass, published a decade later. But the urban crisis was not just a case study of late 20th century Detroit. It claimed to illuminate the nation's larger urban landscape during the early stage of what we might call the post-industrial age. Across the fading industrial terrain, and these are kind of Segru's words, across the fading industrial terrain, Segru writes, and I quote, the faces that appear in the rundown houses, homeless shelters, and social service agencies in these urban wastelands are predictably familiar. Almost all are people of color, particularly African Americans. And so you see why I had a problematic relationship with the ghetto from the beginning. But here we have the time period has shifted. New and more daunting socioeconomic and political changes were underway. Careful attention was given to questions of class, labor, and economic relations. Nonetheless, in important respects, ways of seeing and describing 20th century black urban community reinforce the earlier ghetto framework. Similar to the preceding ghetto model, it gave inadequate attention to black urbanites as architects of their own history. During the first decade of the 21st century, urban studies following this urban crisis model started to proliferate. But at the same time, fortunately, there was a rising groundswell of new studies that countered the urban crisis framework. This scholarship emphasized the place-making role of poor and working class blacks in the transformation of their own communities as the industrial order slipped away. And so I'm compressing quite a bit of historiographical development, lots of studies, many titles, interesting studies, clashing ideas, so I can't elaborate. But what I want to do in the last few minutes that I have left is to suggest that today, as we think about the ghetto, I believe we're entering a new era in the study and practice of African American history. As I think about what young people are doing, and as the senior citizen among them now, Davarian and others, as I think about young people, it seems to me that they are forging their own kind of popular synthesis of the black urban experience and it's departing in some significant ways from my generation. For example, this generation, they are used to seeing, quote, black faces in high places. But recent events have shaken their faith in the democratic claims of the expanding post-industrial order. They are struggling with the profound day-to-day -day emotional and material consequences of the current moment in black history. Recent events in their consciousness include the devastation of Hurricane Katrina, the involuntary mass migration of black residents across the domestic diaspora, the police killing of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, 
Sandra Bland, and most recently in Pittsburgh, Antoine Rose. The, the events in this generation's consciousness also include the burning of Baltimore and Ferguson, the massacre of black people in a South Carolina church, the deadly water supply of Flint, Michigan, and the list goes on and on. But these young people are also currently blending these recent events with the earlier legacy of enslavement, Jim Crow, and the modern black freedom movement. When Trayvon Martin was killed, for example, they saw the face of 13-year-old Emmett Till looking up from the bottom of the Tallahatchie River in Money, Mississippi in 1955. In the face of these mounting conditions, this generation of young people, in the face of these mounting challenges and their own shifting consciousness, they crafted the Black Lives Matter movement. And this movement exploded, as we know, on the scene during Barack Obama's second term as president. The movement for black lives not only organized people and communities on the ground across America, but also in the digital fear. Between 2013 and 2017, the term Black Lives Matter, according to activist historian Barbara Ransby, this term had, quote, penetrated our consciousness and our lexicon from professional sports to primetime television to corporate boardroom and to all sectors of the art world, end of quote. This powerful phrase challenged the prevailing language of color blindness and what had come to be known as post-racialism. Colorblind thinking had gained increasing currency in the wake of Obama's election as the first U.S. president of African descent. Now, the Black Lives Matter movement recognizes the enormous symbolic value of Obama's election, but it accents the persistence of racialized economic inequality, epidemic incarceration of young blacks, and a variety of forms of unchecked state violence against poor and working class black communities. So in a way, this is the context that I believe is going to fuel and is already fueling some rethinking about the nature of black urban life, the nature of spatial segregation, ghettoization, and so on. So as we gather here, a young generation of activists are calling for new theoretical and methodological tools for understanding African-American facial formation. And they are calling for those tools as tools that are needed for the new age, that are appropriate for now, for this history. As in the past, there is evidence that this retooling will include sociology, anthropology, geography, and other social scientific and humanities fields, including history, that these fields will inform the new agenda. And there is a new book uh, from the sociological side titled Chocolate Cities, The Map of American Life, published in 2018 by sociologists Marcus Hunter and Zandria Robinson. In this book, they employ the notion of chocolate cities to understand placemaking from within a variety of predominantly black spaces in US urban history. And so they're trying to change the map, the way we understand the map. And they are using popular culture to help them define a new map for black America. And Malcolm X is a sort of a liftoff point uh, many of you from my generation will remember when Malcolm made that famous speech, the ballad or the, or the bullet, 
And he said, you know, people have some trouble about the South. And he said, well, if you live south of the Canadian border, you are living in the South. And so Robinson and Hunter are trying to reconfigure the way black people look at the map and how they um, understand space and so on. In addition to archival U.S. census and other sources of information, as I uh, pointed out, they are building up on the insights of black popular culture, music, literature, art, and or history. And they firmly believe, following black feminist scholar Barbara Christian, they firmly believe, as Christian said, quote, the wisdom of everyday black folk is knowledge, scientific and underutilized, end of quote. Chocolate cities, they argue, provide new glasses for those unable to see, quote, or blinded by the lens of ghetto, slum, hood, and concrete jungle, end of quote. In their view, a chocolate city perspective will fix the prescription and adjust the sight lines. In other words, as we continue to study the ghetto and transnational perspective, we need to attend to the diverse ways that different nationality, racial, and ethnic groups envision and shape facial formation from within their own particular places, politics, and cultures. Most important, as new ways of dividing land and people develop and intensify in our own times, we will need to adjust our understanding of the past and present. And we will need to work harder, much harder, to forge new and more effective movements for creating inclusive, just, democratic, and humane cities in the future. In closing, I would like to circle back around to my conversation with Wendy at the outset of this study. When I look back over what we learned together, I am happy we took this journey. Our concluding paragraph in the book, I think, says it best. And I want to read that paragraph, part of it, uh, in closing. As we enter a new global era in which the prospects for steady employment become increasingly precarious, as racism and religious hatreds intensify, elites invoke new wall forms of, quote, protection as solution to pressing inequalities. And the United States continues to erect prison walls to house predominantly poor urban people of color, Latino and African Americans. History suggests that we can expect the ghetto to take new forms in new places. And as current leaders in Europe and the United States move to build both literal and figurative walls around the nation state, it is clear that studies of ghettos and ghetto formation will take on ever greater significance in the 21st century. Thank you. So this was a, uh, been a wonderful conversation. I mean, I think what's, I know people have to go, but it's fine. We, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, just, the, just the idea, that this, this notion that it's, this is an ongoing conversation. This archive, again, as I said earlier, is living, is breathing, is thriving. Um, I was most heartened to understand that, that it wasn't just my community that was the first one to use ghetto as an adjective, um, that there was some internal discussions amongst Jews between you know, old and new world Jews about who was, who was acting ghetto, who was you know, perform, being ghetto. So that was just in itself was a good observation for me. Um, but also this idea that bringing together the two, converse, the two commentaries, the way in which Mitch's notion of variation 
got manifest to Professor Meekman's you know, survey of ghetto as encampment, ghetto as uh, uh, community, ghetto as you know, uh, uh, choice, ghetto as structural inequality, but also ghetto as description of a historical process or a sociological process, ghetto as a political critique. There's a way in which, without even knowing it, these, these um, papers offered a wonderful conversation that can open up and hopefully spark um, some wonderful conversation started by you. This is the part where you can participate. And it's, let's engage in some conversation that can continue to take this conversation forward. So your job has just begun. So comments, questions to our distinguished panelists, to each other, uh, not to me, but anyone else. <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, one thing it seems to come for the first black African group is the concept is conflating uh, people, classes, and systems. So when you say ghetto, you talk about, as you say, lifestyle, people together, or it's a geographical place, you know, or it's really, it's really a system of uh, exploitation and oppression. But I would appreciate what I have in the book. But somewhere in the book, there's a definition of ghetto, or at least it is common characteristic. I'll go to New York. I mean, just if I can, I mean, I think it's important. This is, this, is the, this is the tension. The conversation of the idea about ghetto as a type and ghetto as a historical process with very, with different, has, has meant different things at different times. And so this is, the, this is the exact tension where this book sits um, and which these panels have spoken to. You know, is it, can we elevate it to a universal process? History says no. It has meant many things at different times. And so this is, this is fertile ground. I would like to thank you for the book. You know? thing that I find wrong with it is I didn't get an autograph copy. <laughs> so now the books. So I got a copy of the book. And I said, I'll bring back the autograph. <laughs> and for a further conversation, I mean, we're talking to Professor Trotter this, this at lunch, and, and we talked about the fact that there is no discussion of Japanese internment, which is another place ripe for com conversation. Native American realities, the ways in which uh, what was a popular term for black communities, ghetto, in that time period, got reformulated into internal colonialism at a later time. So these, there's a lot of places to go. I have a comment. It's not a question, actually. And going off of what Professor Mishman was saying, um, especially about this journey, semantic journey of the term ghetto, but the idea is that everything starts in Venice. And the question is, why? And here we deal with practices. Why, why in Venice? So Professor Mitch uh, talked also about these other groups, Albanians, which was a problematic term, who Albanian was, but who are Greeks? Who are the Orthodox? And in Venice, in the early 16th century, there was a specific place for the Muslims, for the Muslim merchants, where to stay. And there was also a specific place for the Protestant merchants, especially for the Germans where to stay. And this was a religious segregation. And this religious segregation was not invented in Venice. Because starting in Venice, it it's almost looks like, OK, we find the origins. Here is the origins. Here everything started. Actually, the practice of religious segregation was a practice that was invented in the Byzantine Empire and then also in the Ottoman Empire. And that's the reason why everything emerged in Venice, because Venice was the place of communication between the Western Europe and the Orient. So instead of talking just about the regions, I would say that religious segregation is something that travels and takes new meanings, is a practice that is, evolves, it is transformed across time, but it doesn't start in one place. It circulates and communicates, especially in border areas where differences, where great civilizations, different big religions contest, compete, but also communicate with each other. So I think that when we talk about Venice, we have to contextualize Venice into a larger historical context. Thank you. Other comments or questions? 
Oh, sorry. Hey. Um, I was wondering, I appreciate that you were referring to, um, to the ghetto also as a way to define protection, sort of, right? So a, a place in which you can find uh, an identity or um, people you, you, you deem as similar. I was, and I, I wonder how, how that could be one of the ways to sort of resist gentrification. I was on the, east, uh, on the east side of Pittsburgh Saturday night on my bike and my helmet, and I felt so stupid. And in fact, I was actually someone was passing with a car, and they said I was me and a friend of mine with exactly the same, you know, dress code of a sort of early gentrifier. And, and this guy went out of the car and said, get out of my hood. And I was like, wow, that's powerful. That's exactly where I should go. I should get out of your hood. It's, it's right. But I was wondering if there is a sort of, uh, you were saying there is a germ of resistance every time there is also a, a term of, of community. I wonder if that is also a way to, um, to reclaim uh, areas of the city um, and to resist a sort of it seems a sort of compulsory, a compulsive uh, gentrification that, that's, that's going on all, all over the place, uh, uh, also in this. Did you want to respond? Did you want to respond? Uh, <coughs> yes, okay. So just uh, uh, very quickly, um, as far as Venice being the origin, Venice is not the origin of uh, walled enclosures, especially not for merchants, nor is it the origin of uh, separate living quarters for different religious groups, as was pointed out. Venice is the origin of one thing, the word. G-E-T-T-O means foundry. And so when we began the project, we began not as a history of segregation, which is a whole an, a related subject, but not the same. So we decided we were going to begin in Venice because that's where the word originated, if not the practice. Um, and as far as your comments about get out of my hood, um, I feel that all the time whenever I go back to my old neighborhood <laughs> of the Lower East Side and I see what's going on there. It's, I feel like, go home. Um, and you know, Jews tried to get out of that neighborhood. And yet at the same time, you now see it just being turned into, it's like a tourist venue or something. Um, and that feeling of both, the feeling of wanting to protect something, uh, that's not necessarily something that was ever considered positive or good, or it was always something that was lowly, but at the same time it was yours. And so I think you got a little bit of that, you got a taste of that. The ghettos are being unmade to some degree. We've got that happening here in Pittsburgh. Not being unmade, as Brian Purnell wrote about, through development, or rather, they're being unmade through development, but they're also being made through mass displacement. Um, and I think you got a little bit of that taste as well. Uh, I don't know whether it was a white working class person that said to you that, or a black working class person that said that to you, but. On some level, it doesn't really matter. It was, you know, about a neighborhood. Yeah. Well, actually, I think, I, I'm just gonna say that, you know, the ghetto framework, I think looking inside the community and seeing how people use the language is pretty much one of the things that we're really interested in and would like to see, you know, more, um, you know, over time, people probing inside uh, one part of the ghetto that I didn't make a big point about is that there, there was at one point in the uh, period of the Black Power Movement where people uh, just took the ghetto and transformed it into a term of empowerment. And it came to be a marker. If you were not from the ghetto, you were not empowered in certain settings. And so these kinds of ways of thinking. But still, I, I can, it, let, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, when I said I had been fighting against the ghetto for quite a long time, well, I had uh, in my first book on, on black Milwaukee. But 
in the end, I came to embrace a certain uh, dimension of the ghetto, but mainly to describe a racially segregated space that had a lot to do with the way whites imposed a certain kind of limitation on black housing. You know, through race uh, violence, uh, through zoning laws, through all kinds of restrictive covenant. And so I thought that we could retrieve that notion at a certain level without buying into the idea that the people who live there um, subscribe to this idea that they were totally disempowered. Because it really, if we, if, if we do that, then we're undermining the degree to which they built institutions inside that space that were driven by their own uh, sense of what was needed, you know, to survive and develop uh, within that context. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but that's the floor of my take on aspect of I also think in the 70s and 80s, you saw this connection between ghetto and cultural poverty that um, people like Professor Charlie were running, like myself, were running from the way in which it became that ghetto was a description of a people and the reason for their containment. <laughs> so that's another thing as well. I would like to pick up a piece of what you said, and that is the compulsory uh, elimination of the ghetto. That is what I understand as gentrification. That if you see a compulsory eviction process take place, it does lead to cultural poverty, the dispersing of the institutions from that area. And I've seen it happen with YMCA's clothes. I've seen it happen with whole uh, people's entire neighborhoods being taken over, mine in Brooklyn, many here. Um, and what happens in that dispersion is the dispersion of those institutions that have created the cultural um, life of that community. So I think not about the ghetto, but about the next phase of what we're looking at, the compulsory dismantling of those concentrations of people of color or any religious group is in fact another phenomenon that causes uh, all kinds of consequences. I think to build on that, we, we, today when we see uh, economic corruption at the top and Ponzi schemes, we don't theorize a culture, a culture of prosperity. We don't psychologize those people whole cloth by their race, and we could, but Inversely, we do. We, we have no problem saying, even in the most generous way, that, well, yes, they are, they are mired in structural, in structural conditions, and, and it produces certain kind of dysfunctional qualities that come out of that, and therefore, it's justifiable that they're dysfunctional. It's justifiable that they're marginal. It's justifiable that they're deviant. We don't, we don't do that equally across the board. And so I definitely know that I was running, against, running away from the ways in which ghetto had become a way to become a shorthand to psychologize uh, uh, black poverty inequality as something psychological, something culturally de deficient. And so I just, you know, ask us to pause, that's, that's a side note, but ask us to pause about that. But I think what brings it all back together in a powerful way is that we can try to typify, we can try to universalize, we can try to find a, a, a clear and universal definition of ghetto, but if we look at this book in any real robust way, Every section is grounded in what the voices from the archive said themselves. That the variation comes from the multiple ways in which historical actors thought about ghetto, talked about ghetto, defined ghetto. And that's different than being a scholar that looks back and says, well, let me try to find an ideal definition or type. Two different things. I think it's important that we maintain the distinction between those two approaches. And, I, and I, I'm thankful that, you know, in part because I'm trained by a historian, that this approach is prevalent here, that it's what are these historical actors, how did they use the term ghetto? I actually got critis, critis, crit, criticized by an by a academic reviewer because I was reviewing, I was writing about the, the multiple ways in which African Americans were using the term ghetto as a political critique. And the reader said, well, there's no, there's no uh, clear terminology. It's, it's, it means too many things. 
And I was like, wait a minute, isn't this a history journal? This, the, the point here is that these are the ways in which black folk articulated ghetto for their own purposes. Isn't that what we do? And so I, I think that that's something we got to keep in our minds as we move forward with these concepts and terms. So I think actually we're coming to an end here. Yeah. I just would like to say one thing to vary about what you just said. And that is that I think maybe for the first time we have seen some white, rich, privileged men characterized in a particular way. We just all saw Brett Kavanaugh, yeah. and we know what he looks like now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you might- there's no, there's, no, there's no sociology about it though, but okay. Uh, there's no academic study. I think among certain women's groups, there's beginning to be a little bit of a sociology of it. So at any rate, on that note, I will uh, thank you all very, very much for coming.